The year is 1075. The place, Richmond Castle in North Yorkshire. I must go in. I must pour watered milk for the servants and rich curd in cups for my master and his knights. Do you hear them heckle and shout in their foreign tongue? The winters here are very cold. I must make a bed of nettles. I must place nettles under my clothes for warmth. And once I gave the orders here. This was our land, and I was free. See, my hair is long, a sign of my freedom. But these men, these devils, to them we are all scullions, people of dirt. They will grow rich, and we will bleed. Who is she? A Saxon. In the year 1066, the Normans had invaded England and conquered her people. They'd imposed new laws, new customs, a new language. They built castles, they ruled supreme. Suis Comte de Bretagne, fils de Dodo Pontièvre, suis Alain le Rouge. Ici à Richemont, long de Grasse 1071, a érigé mon château de pierre. His name? Alan the Red. It was he that built Richmond. He'd fought for the Norman Duke William, helped him destroy Saxon resistance. It was men like him, speaking French, that now forced their new and foreign way of life upon England. But why in 1066 did Norman and Saxon so collide? What story does the evidence reveal? See how Royal Edward, England's ruler, has departed this life. A great king, a hero amongst heroes. Death has called him away. Edward the Confessor had ruled England for 23 years. He left behind a country rich in its traditions of law and government. With fertile soil, metals buried in its hillsides, oysters on its seabeds. But he'd also left behind an empty throne. For Edward died childless. And four rivals now lined up to claim the English crown. There are some as say the crown should go to Edgar. He is the king's closest relative. But he's just a boy. This would be foolish. And there is a king of Denmark, Hardrada, that would have the crown. And Harold, an Earl of England, he is my choice. A very fine and upright man. And then there is William, the Duke of Normandy, that some called bastard for his father, they say, seduced a tanner's daughter. And so William was born. Of all the four, I would not have William. For his knights, these Normans, they are so particular. In their dress, in their manner. Eating and drinking with care. Never too much. They frighten me. Normandy lay across the channel from Saxon England. It was part of France, but the Norman dukes were strong and did as they chose. They sent their soldiers throughout Europe to Sicily, the Middle East. All agreed they were a warlike race. But whether for God or the devil was less than clear. All the Normans care about is money. Gold and silver means everything to them. They don't care what sins they commit, as long as they make a profit. Who's talking? A Saxon chronicler writing from the Saxon point of view. Norman chronicler saw things differently. We Normans are outstanding. We're scholars, men of letters. We're Christians, builders of cathedrals and monasteries. And if we are famed for war, if our swords are always drawn, it is only to defend what is just and honorable. So, was the Norman conquest of England just and honorable? This is the Bayeux Tapestry, 
made by the Normans to tell their story of the conquest. Like their chronicles, it shows William's motives in a favorable light. Well, you see, William, Duke of Normandy, had been promised the crown of England by King Edward himself. For Edward loved William like a father. But when Edward died, what happened? Harold took the crown for himself. Can you blame William for wishing to reclaim what was rightly his? So he ordered an invasion fleet be built, 3,000 ships loaded with horses, the finest warriors. Were the Saxons taken in by this Norman propaganda? Hardly. I have heard another story, that Edward on his deathbed named Earl Harold his heir, that William is simply a man of greed, that he would conquer not because it is his right, but because he is a man of war. It is in his nature. Neither the Saxon nor the Norman version can be proved. The evidence hasn't survived. It's September the 27th, 1066. William lands at Pevensey Bay on the south coast. Harold is in the north, seeing off another rival threat from Hardrada and his Danish army. He marches south in just eight days. And at last, on the morning of October the 14th, the battle-weary Saxons take a position on a ridge six miles northwest of Hastings. <laughs> It's true they had the advantage. Defensive, uphill, tight ranks, but they were tired. And we had the smell of reward in our nostrils, itching for the kill. They didn't stand a chance. So you tie up your chin guard and you wait for the signal. And then, do you hear the trumpets, the war cries? You can't. Your ears are exploding with the crash of arms, the groans of the dying. Our knights are beaten back. We nearly lost it. But the experience pays. Draw them off. Pretend to run. The barbarian Saxon thinks he's won. He follows you down. You turn, he's yours. Ha! It was delicious. We spent the evening on the road hunting those that got away. Our horses crushed them underfoot. Hastings was a devastating victory. Harold was dead, his army conquered. And thus, his triumph complete in spite of so many dangers, a glorious duke on Christmas Day in London town was crowned king. And now, this just man, William the Powerful, William the Prosperous, William the Conqueror, rules over the whole kingdom of England. But was Hastings the end of the story? No. It took four more years before William truly ruled over the whole kingdom of England. But his achievement was remarkable. His army of just 10,000 faced a hostile population of two million Saxons. How did he succeed against such odds? The Saxons were brave and warlike, but they had very few of those fortifications which the Normans call castles in their land. It was this that made them weak, quite unable to stand up to their conquerors. It's simple. You ride in fast, set fire to their villages, a little terror, a little sword play, they're quaking in their shoes, petrified, which gives you the time you need to raise a castle. Three weeks if you push hard by which time maybe they've got their thoughts together, maybe brewing a small counter-attack, planning some mild rebellion, but it's too late, because there's this castle on the skyline and we're watching their every move, safe as houses. <laughs> and soon as that district's under control, the castle's our base for the next push forward, until, like a spider's web, we cover the land with a castle at every junction, and the Saxon has nowhere to run. Didn't the Saxons ever fight back? Of course. William's reign was plagued with uprisings in Kent, the southwest, 
the Fenlands, and especially the North. But the penalties were high. The Normans were unforgiving. Take the 29th of January, 1069. The governor of York and his Norman followers have just been burnt to death by Saxon rebels. Swift was the king's coming, and nowhere did William show more cruelty. He cut down many in his vengeance, and then in his anger he commanded that all crops and herds, food of every kind, should be burned to strip the land of its goodness. As we dragged ourselves into exile, there were many as sank by the wayside and breathed their last. The hunger was very great, so we had no choice. People ate horse flesh, dog meat, even the flesh of men. There were corpses everywhere, swarming with worms, rotting. The smell was terrible, for there was no one to bury them. All were cut off by sword and famine. All the farmland has been left untended these past nine years. Weeds choke the crops. And in all the villages between York and Durham, there are no people. Only robbers and wild beasts lurking in the shadows. The Norman takeover of England was absolute. Just 3% of the land still in Saxon hands, the rest carved up between William, the church, and leading Norman barons. Land was a reward for help in battle. I, William, King of England, do give and grant to thee, Alan the Red, and to thy heirs, all the towns and lands which lately belong to Earl Edwin in Yorkshire, given at the siege before York. Earl Edwin was one of the Saxon leaders. Earl Edwin was my husband. He'd surrendered to William, but eventually he got uppity. Bad mistake. They besieged York. They smoked him out. He died on the run. King William gave me his lands. Too kind. It was no less than I'd expected. And Count Allen rides up to our manor house and says, no, it's too small for me, burn it. And next I hear he's building a castle in stone at Richmond and were to go there as servants. He looked so proud, the new master. Do you wonder these Normans fought with such relish? They knew the rewards. Winner take all. The conquest had made Alan the Red enormously wealthy. Over 400 manors in Lincolnshire, Suffolk, the southeast, enough land to reward his own army of knights, each of whom had to turn out three weeks a year and guard the jewel of his empire, Richmond. I am Ranulf, son of Robert. My guard is the chapel of St. Nicholas on the east wall. I am Conan, son of Elias. And I, Roaldus, the constable. Together we man the great tower. There are cellars and granaries and stables and kitchens filled with domestic utensils. There's a place for the sick where they might light a fire. There are workshops where weapons are forged. And there is a great hall for my lord, the residents, the watchmen, the servants. The hall was the castle's hub. Here, on the first floor, Alan's knights would eat and sleep on boards covered in rushes, scraps of food, bones, dirt. There'd be entertainment, high spirits, but also discipline and strict justice. Their taxes are very harsh. Six shillings yearly for every hide of land, and their laws are cruel. If a man is found in the forest with bow in hand, or dog without its forepaws clipped, that man has his eyes put out, for the forest is under their protection. They love the deer as if they were their children. I must go in. I must pour watered milk for the servants, and rich curd in cups for my master and his knights, and have them mock me 
and call me dog. I know that word, sheer. They'll bark out an order, and I will not understand. And they will see me, silent and questioning. And they will strike me for defying them. How can I be defiant when I do not understand? I would that I could understand, that I might be defiant. Was there always this tension between ruler and ruled? Again, it depends who's telling the story. Saxon and Norman intermarry freely and live at peace. There are markets filled with Norman goods, and the Saxon, whose native dress once seemed so laughable to the Norman, is now transformed by Norman fashion. Everyone cultivates their fields safely and lives contentedly with their neighbour. Perhaps after the first shock of conquest, people just tried to get on with their lives. Certainly, after a couple of hundred years, the boundaries between Norman and Saxon had so blurred it became hard to tell them apart. William the Conqueror ruled England for 21 years, until in the year 1087. My lord, the king died. It was at Saint-Gervais. He'd been sick, couldn't take food, so he prayed for his soul and for his kingdom, and he set some prisoners free. And then he urged us home to our estates, lest the news of his death spark off riots. I mounted horse and went with speed to Richmond to guard my property. And it's said that after we nobles had gone, the servants at Saint-Gervais made off with the silver, the linen, the royal furniture, and the corpse of William the Conqueror was left almost naked on the floor of his cell. William left behind a country transformed. New buildings, cathedrals like this one at Gloucester, new laws, a new language. The Normans had boosted trade, encouraged artistry, learning, the growth of towns. But did this justify conquest? This is William of Malmesbury, a monk of both Norman and Saxon blood. Of course, remember the Normans for their good points. Their skill in war, the cathedrals they built, all that. But I tell you this, sometimes I can't help thinking England would have been better off unconquered. For you see, everything wonderful the Normans achieved, they paid for out of the profits of destruction and plunder. There can never be just one history. For there is the history of the conqueror, and there is the history of the conquered and their two stories are rarely the same.